because I've been doing this a long time with other animals, it sort of reinvigorated my passion for training and behavior because now I'm working with new species. And it's so cool to see snakes and reptiles do some of these behaviors. Yeah, no doubt. Howdy folks, Brian Cusco here at Redline Report. And today we've got a special treat for you. We're sitting down with Lori Torini. Lori's work with different reptile species, snakes in particular, behavioral stuff, is uh, something unlike I've seen anywhere else. So we're gonna hear a little bit about her journey doing that, her techniques, and let's get right into it. You're watching Redline Report. This, this show is about the people that are coming to sit down. I'm just here to facilitate, um, l hopefully, letting other people hear what it is that the different folks in this hobby, hobby and industry and this world of reptile keeping, like what individual things you have to offer to it that is your own, you know, because right. there's so many of us doing so many different things and everybody has good things or bad things that they bring. And um, just yeah. like to highlight whatever those are, because they're all different. No, if, if anybody's honest about their full story, it's not, it's not like anybody else's. Right. They're always, they're always um, special and uh, have their own thing to bring. Of course. Yeah. So. But yours, yours is... Uh, mine is very different. Probably. Yours is very different. Mine is very different. That's why I specifically reached When I found out that you were going to be here, <laughs> um, that's why I reached out specifically to you because I wanted to hear a bit about yeah. that. Because it is so much different than what most people that I have sit down with. Like, you know, people are breeding or, you know, have a hobby thing going. They go to shows and they vend. But you are definitely... I'm definitely not in those categories. Definitely not in those categories. No. No. And you definitely do a lot of behavioral work with the animals I that do. is yeah. on a much higher level than I think most people engage in with it's, their animals. It's a higher level than most people engage in with any of their animals, but especially with reptiles. Like, you don't see people... Well, I see people training their reptiles now because I have a whole client base that I work with, but you just don't see it as a norm. Yeah. I think you see many more people nor training their dogs, at least taking them to puppy class or taking them to obedience school. They may not do more advanced training with them, but at least they're teaching their dogs usually to sit and calm and walk on a leash. But you don't see people teaching their reptiles basic things, even basic ways to communicate with us and make life easier on us and on them. So I came to the reptile herpeticulture. I came to herpeticulture as an animal trainer and behaviorist already. So I was already um, had a degree in zookeeping and working with many species of animals both um, domestic and some exotic animals. And so I just came to it as another, this is another animal, this is just one more species I'm working with, but I definitely saw a deficit amongst reptile keepers where they just didn't have a concept that they could train their snake or other reptile, or that they should be paying attention to the reptile's behavior because the reptile is always communicating things to us. And when we ignore that, that's when we get into trouble. That's when we get bitten or the animal gets stressed or we have train wrecks happen. I mean, I, ha I seldom have any drama because I watch their body language. I listen to what they're telling me. I teach them the meaning of my body language. I teach them signals so we can communicate and we just have a smooth life for the most part. Yeah, that's cool. I, I've gotten to do some of that myself, just in, just in watching them and, you know, uh -huh. how they react and just kind of paying attention to that stuff. And, um, but one thing I would say, I mean, I've trained them to, in a way to like know my touch and stuff. And like, I, one of the things I do that is probably has been the most beneficial is like when they're babies is doing a little like chin pets and little gentle rubs there to where, and my, my thought here, and maybe you can correct me here. <laughs> my thought is that that's a pretty vulnerable spot for them. And if they can get comfortable being touched there by me and, and realize that, they realize pretty quickly because, you know, when I'm doing it slowly and gently, they're not trying to bite me. They're not trying to run away. And there's like, this guy's touching me they're in a spot that I could be dead in a yeah. second. And, but yet I'm, yet it's gentle and yes. not harming me. And so when I talk to people about touch and handling and training that, I always have people start with proximity first. You know, you don't just meet someone for the first time usually and get very personal with them physically. So Make sure your reptile is comfortable with your proximity. Mm. Can you even be in the room with them or near their enclosure without them exhibiting signs of fear, anxiety, and distress? And once you can basically sit really close to them and go about your business and they could care less, that's when you start interacting more and you just build up through gradual desensitization. And the head, especially for a snake, is a very vulnerable place because that is where they encounter prey. 
that's either going to try to hurt them to get away or they're having to, you know, acquire and manage. And um, the tail's also vulnerable because if they're trying to escape from a predator, the tail is what's left behind and that's what something's going to grab. The head's also super sensitive because we know through the study of neuroscience that all vertebrates have cells in their brain that are sensitive to looming stimuli. So when there are dark expanding objects coming near or things looming above us and snakes and other vertebrates, these cells trigger an innate fear response, an innate defensive response. And so you've got to gradually desensitize the snakes or other reptiles to you being above them, to you touching their head, to you handling them in the tail in these places that would normally be vulnerable. So I usually don't have people start there. I usually have people start more unobtrusively, like under the belly in the center of the body, places where they're less sensitive. Mm. Yeah, I guess I should maybe mention that when I do that, like I've already, I'm already holding them at that right. point. So it's like that, that's kind of right. like that next step to really just get to the spot of like, there's no harm that's going to be done to you right. by me. Um, mid, mid body yeah. is that after establishing that proximity is not a problem for them. Right. Maybe one of the so, tough things, so go ahead. Well, you establish that proximity is not a problem. And I like to sit near their habitats. And when they're at the point where they're ignoring me, then I know I can go to the next step. And that's usually, for me, opening the door. And then I go about my business. And eventually, usually they come out at some point through this process. And then I just watch them and let them explore outside of the enclosure and get more and more comfortable just being in the human world. You know, they're not naturally adapted to live in your house or in your zoo or in your classroom. or So they need to get used to all the stimuli and everything that they're perceiving in that environment. And once they're comfortable with that, then I start to handle more and touch more. But I like for them to come out first and not be intruding into their space because that's automatically going to boost up the level of defensiveness on their part. So once they're already out, if they stray too far from sort of the area that I've deemed safe, that's when I'll scoop them up from underneath, put them back to a safe spot, not return them to the enclosure because I don't want to punish them but I just want to move them back to this area that I've designated. This is where you can roam around. And so that's how I start touch and handling is just let me pick you up real quick and put you back. And then sometimes they'll come out and explore me. Like the super dwarf free ticks are good for that. You know, in fact, I can't, sometimes I'm trying to work in my office and mine won't leave me alone. He's taking my glasses off my face. He's crawling on my laptop <laughs> and I have to move him and several times when I'm trying to work. So super dwarf free ticks stand out as being very affiliative with people, and I'm not sure you know, how that's evolved to be, but they're my most affiliative snakes hmm. with people. If you want to label them friendly, of course, that is bringing them up the way that I raise them, too. So I can't speak to ones that might have been treated differently. Sure. But, you know. Yeah, it's cool to hear some of that stuff you're saying because I, I had stood that with some of my mainland reticulated pythons who are very acclimated to human yeah. touch. My in one in particular, my biggest girl, um, you know, 16 foot, 100 pound snake has been handled by thousands of children at this point. But I still, when I when it's time to clean her enclosure, my go-to move is open up all the enclosure, go about doing some other stuff, and wait for her to come right. out. And that's, because that's her choice. You're right. And so she's coming out. She's cruising around. You can go do enclosure maintenance. There's no drama. That's the way that I manage all of my snakes. And if I need to do enclosure maintenance and they don't come out, because they're not all going to be that enthusiastic about coming out. Most, most of mine are. I have species that are pretty resilient and pretty curious. But I have a few that don't want to come out. So I use hides with bottoms and wait until they're in one of those, and then I just lift the hide out. If I absolutely have to bring them out, like for a veterinary visit or for some emergency, I have a no choice cue, which I touch them and it signals them, hey, you're going to be touched and picked up and I'm going to intrude into your space. So I'm just letting you know that I'm going to touch you. And that way, even though it might not be something they like, it, it makes the situation predictable. So they know what's going to happen and they can manage it better and it's going to keep that stress level down if they know what's about to happen, even if it's something that they don't like. So if you're going to get a vaccination or you're going to go to the dentist, you may not like it, but if you know what's going to happen, you're willing to tolerate that. Versus if I just grab you off the street and yank a tooth out of your mouth. <laughs> 
or <laughs> grab you off the street and jab you with the needle. <laughs> yeah. I, it's going to be a whole different situation. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Oh, man. So if we can communicate to the snake or other reptile what's about to happen, even if it's something they would maybe not choose, it's still going to keep the stress level down because they know what to expect. So there's, I would say, some reptile experts out there that would, you know, say based on just anatomy, you know, there's no, there's no um, neocortex and just basically the reptile brain, which is made for flight or fight. Well, that, and, that's, a, a mis, that's a myth, I guess. I'll just yeah. say it's a myth. So. Um, the snake's brain and other reptile brains have the same or homologous structures as other vertebrates. They're vertebrates. They have a, sp a brain and a spinal cord and a central nervous system that's the same as all vertebrates have the same parts. So they have the same brain structure as other vertebrates. Now, the structures may be assembled a little differently. So if you think of an airplane versus a helicopter... They both fly, but they produce lift in different ways. The helicopter uses the rotors, and the plane is going to produce lift via the wings. So the reptile's brain and the bird's brain, the, the non-avian reptile brain, so snakes, lizards, other things that we like, and the brain of birds has a dorsal ventricular ridge, and neuro neuroscientists think that is homologous to the neocortex. Oh, interesting. So, you know, um, they can still problem solve. They can still have some higher executive functioning. And the cells in the dorsal ventricular ridge are the same structure of cells that are in our neocortex. They're just put together in helicopter form instead of airplane mm. form, but they still fly. So I think if you think of it that way, it isn't that they are incapable of reasoning and problem solving and higher functioning. They just do it with a slightly different brain structure than we do. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, animals have adapted to behave and they've adapted to problem solve and they've adapted to be able to use their brain in order to survive. So if you think of a snake, it eventually has to leave the ground or the burrow or the tree or the rock crevice or the cave. And it has to go look for resources. It has to look for food, for mates, for water, for shelter. It has to thermoregulate. If something happens to its current refuge, it has to find a new one. And it has to travel to do that. And in those travels, they traverse all kinds of different terrain and weather and territory. And they're going to meet other animals. So they have to not only be able to predate to eat, but they have to avoid predation to live. And then they have to get back home. And they have to be able to problem solve along the way and do that safely. And if they couldn't think and learn, then they wouldn't have survived a million, nine, 100 million years, however long snakes have been around. I mean, there's just no way that they could sit there and not problem solve and survive as a species. It's not going to happen. Yeah. I've watched some pretty interesting, you know, it's anecdotal, I guess, but some really interesting behavior from snakes in, in things like that, where they're clearly not just a flight or fight mechanism. Like one, two, I'll give two examples that I've seen that were really cool. Um, my buddy had this tiger reticulated python, and we're mm -hmm. out at this educational like event in the park in Ventura, California. It was a big grassy area, and there's people everywhere, and like people have brought their reptiles to as a as a in a public way, like kind of uh -huh. share re their love for reptiles. And and this guy's retic went through the grass. There are people standing everywhere. He was like she was going through all these different people's feet, and just and found him. And crowd yes. up him yeah. specifically in a crowd full of people. There's that one, and then there's a, somebody pointed me at this video of a girl that taught her ball python to fetch online. I don't know if you've seen this video. It's pretty cool to watch. I bet on, I haven't. What's it fetching? A ball, a little wooden ball. <laughs> and she she's sitting on her bed, and she tosses the ball across the other side of the bed. Snake goes out, coils around the ball, brings it back to her, and I was like, oh, that was interesting. That's very cool. And then she did it a second time, and the snake went grabbed the ball again, brought it back to her. And then it was when she did it a third time and the snake went back across the other side of the bread and brought it back. It's like, okay, you taught your snake to fetch. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So it doesn't surprise me because um, in the beginning of the pandemic, Ken Ramirez, who's a, a very well-known animal trainer, and I come from the animal training world, so people in the reptile community are going to be like, I don't know who Ken Ramirez is, but he was hosting these virtual sessions for trainers and other people, and he would challenge you every week to teach an animal a behavior. 
and he one week said, okay, this week's training challenge is to have your, anim, your dog or cat or other animal put a ball in a basket or put an object in a basket. So I worked for days and taught one of my corn snakes to roll a ball off a table and into a basket that I had hanging there. And I submitted several videos and a lot of them got put on his show. Um, not that one in particular, but one week he um, said, teach your animal to discriminate between two targets, their target and one that doesn't mean anything. And I did that with two of my inland carpet pythons and he did play that video. So that was fun when he was doing those training challenges because it made me up my game with the snakes because yeah, I could have grabbed one of my dogs or horses and done these things, but I thought, no, challenge yourself and see if you can teach the snakes to do all the training challenges that he is coming up with. And, and that was really, that really pushed me to another level because I had to problem solve. How could I teach a snake to do this behavior? How did you do that? Um, with positive reinforcement. Mm. So first, I just captured the behavior. So I put um, the ball on the table and the snake's moving around. And as soon as it touched the ball, I gave it a little fuzzy mouse. And then I did it again. And you just make that connection between the ball and the food reward. And so then you just incrementally teach them, okay, now you're not going to get the food for just touching it. And so you wait for them to do something else, and when they push it or make it move, then you give the food until they realize, okay, I have to push the ball this far, and it has to fall off the table before I get reinforced. So that's how I do most of the training. I use a lot of food reinforcers, but I also use freedom as a reinforcer. Freedom is very reinforcing for vertebrates, for all animals. They're even doing research with invertebrates, but... Freedom is very reinforcing because in nature, if we didn't have freedom to choose to problem solve, we wouldn't survive. If we didn't have control of our own behavioral outcomes, no organism is going to be able to survive long. So freedom is innately reinforcing. And in the opposite is also true. Constraint is just innately aversive. It's mm. something no organism likes. So that's why if we can teach the snakes and other reptiles to work with us and choose to do behaviors we want, they, their stress level stays lower. It's safer for us. We don't have drama. I don't like to create drama with the animals. I like them to stay low key. Yeah, definitely. That's cool, Lori. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the work you're doing. I, I like that you've been thinking outside the box so much and then not, not just thinking outside, but like acting on your thoughts and making it a reality it's and then very rewarding yeah very and actually in some respects the snakes <laughs> and reptiles are easier to train and work with than the dogs or horses because i think sometimes you know the closer an animal is to the wild the more quickly they learn the more quickly they understand there are consequences to every action mm. and and i'll need to remember this consequence or the next time I could die, or the next time I might not get food, or the next time, you know, something horrible may happen. But dogs that have kind of co-evolved with us these last few thousand years, and horses who are very familiar with us, they take liberties and, I think, do their own thing more, ignore <laughs> yeah, they <do>. more, <laughs> because they don't, they don't have to be on top of things in order to survive. Mm. And they're all, they also don't have that distance from us that wild animals are going to have. You know, there's sometimes when you get too familiar with someone, maybe with your kids, that's when they stop listening to you and they stop doing things for you. Um, but your kid is probably more apt to listen to a stranger than to you sometimes. And so think about wild animals versus those that have just innately been raised with us and lived with us for generations and we selectively bred. They're going to have less of, um, pay attention to us a little bit less. So there are times my dogs ignore me when I'm trying to train them and work with them and they easily get distracted and decide they want to go do their own thing. But the snakes are actually very attentive and very engaged. But it also may be that they don't have 100% freedom and they're, you know, they find it reinforcing just to be out of the enclosure doing activities. And oftentimes it's very easy to get them out, cue them to come out, get them to do activities. It's much harder to get them to go back in. Mm. Because, again, restraint is aversive. You know, captive situations are aversive for all vertebrates. And so they enjoy that freedom of being out. Most of them do. Yeah. Well, Not all, but many of them. What's interesting to see is, so what has what worked with that big 
retic that I have that thousands of kids have, have touched. Um, she will go out to the show and we'll, we'll hang out with her. And, you know, all the kids we hold her, I'll have them stand in line. She'll crawl through all their arms and we'll let her crawl around on the grass or wherever we happen to be, auditorium, and just, like, let her do her thing. And then this happens every single time, every single show. I will bring her box that she came in out and I'll set it out there for her to be able to get to. And then she decides she's had enough She'll with go the kids. Back in. She go every every single every single show this has happened. She crawls back in the box, curls yep. up, and is like, "Get me out of here." <laughs> so that that brings up a great point. I usually have a shift container or some way for the snake to opt out, so that if they are done engaging, they no longer want to engage, and they have that tool to communicate that to me. And that's a perfect example. Our um, our bull snake Rodney. She is always eager to shift out, usually. But on the rare occasion she doesn't, then I know we're not going to work with her that day because she chose not to come out. When she does come out, she has a shift container. And when she's done roaming, exploring, when she's done with whatever we're doing and she's ready to go back to her enclosure, she goes into her shift container. It's like her transporter back to her habitat. And we've conditioned that over time. So now she absolutely knows... If I go in this container, it's a trip back to my habitat. And there are times when I have her in an exercise space that's safe where she won't go near that shift container for two or three days. And then I'll find her in there one day, and it's because she's ready to go back. And it isn't that it's the only hide. She has myriad hides and other things to interact with. But that is her transporter, and that is the connection that we've made and that I've taught her over the years. So she knows that's how I get back to my habitat. Wow. So that's a really important thing that you do when you take animals to these educational presentations is teach them a, a way to communicate to you when they've had enough. Okay, I've had enough. I'm ready to stop. I'm ready to go back. I'm ready to be left alone. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm, I'm stoked to be sitting down talking to you because I've, I've <laughs> kind of really enjoyed hearing about these things. <laughs> sorry. Hear, hearing about these things you've been doing and... Uh, if, if people want to follow along with all the cool work that you're doing, where's the best place for them to do that? I have a website. It's behavioreducation.org. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. And I have a Patreon. It's just patreon.com slash behavioreducation. YouTube is the hub where I put a lot of my educational content and, and all of my videos. So I was doing three videos a week, a training video, um, an educational video, and then a random behavior video. But I'm getting, finishing up my master's now, and I'm super busy with grad school. So now I'm doing one video a week for the time being. Yeah, at least, as long as you're getting at least one a week, I think that's still good. Yeah. yeah. So it's all behavior education on all those platforms? It is. Okay. Or just my name, Lori Torini. Cool. Yeah. I'm really excited about the work. I'm really impressed with what reptiles are capable of doing. And I really enjoy working with them. I mean, they're quiet, and they're so... Um, not needy mm. the way some other animals are, like your dogs and cats For and sure. horses. It's like sometimes you just want, I love you, but leave me alone. <laughs> and I really don't run into that with the snakes. I have two Brettles pythons that roam my office, free roam my office. So nice to have them there and to see them and have them be close, but not getting into my personal space. So I really enjoy that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, anything that you, want, before we wrap, anything you'd want to say to folks that like, are looking to delve more into their reptiles' behavior and how they interact with them? Like, any, any words of encouragement or inspiration? Like, what, what's, what's their next step if that's something they want to do? It's possible, and it's so easy that you shouldn't even hesitate. People always ask me, how old does my snake or reptile have to be to start training? If it's eating, it can be training. So as soon as I bring a new snake home, the first feeding, I'm pairing it with a training target or a station or something. So if it's eating, it can be training. And then just be patient about the handling because you want to build trust and you want that snake or the reptile to come and climb onto you. And if you can't be patient and you're intruding right away and I'm going to snatch it out every day because I want to hold it, it's going to start to associate you with dislike and displeasure. And, and it's going to actually start to hide more and try more escape and avoidance behavior but if you just be patient, let it get used to you, let it come to you, you're going to have a much more rewarding relationship with it. And I would start if, with my YouTube channel. I've written articles, I've published papers, but people generally like to watch videos. So start with YouTube. I have some playlists on snake cognition. I have a step-by-step -step target training playlist. 
Um, I've got videos about snake body language and I have cheat sheets available, like simple body language charts. So go to my website, email me, behaviorucationllc at gmail.com or on YouTube. Um, I have all this contact information at the end of my videos, but I'm happy to provide resources. I also want to emphasize, since we're at a reptile expo, <laughs> choose the reptile that's going to fit your lifestyle. Many people want to get a reptile based on how it looks, or my friend has one, or I saw this on TV and it looked really cool, and they don't research the species natural history and behavior, and then they get it home, and it's not working out with who they are and their lifestyle, and that can be a train wreck too. So I, I do consult with a lot of people before they even get a pet reptile to make sure we're getting the right species that's going to be a good match for the, their expectations. Because if your expectations are in one place, but you pick a species that's not going to meet any of those expectations, that is not going to be a rewarding experience. And some species are just going to be more inherently affiliative with people than others. And if you are not a night person and you get a nocturnal species, you're never going to see it. And you can't change who that animal is. They are who they are. They've adapted to be that. And it's not fair for us to ask them to change because we're selfish and we want them to be awake during the day when they're normally awake at midnight. So I would just say take a deep breath and be patient when you're picking out your reptile and make sure it is going to suit your expectations and your lifestyle. Perfect. Awesome, Lori. Well, All thank right. you. I appreciate you coming sitting down with me. Thank for you. Here. I appreciate yeah, the thank opportunity. Thank you so much. Big thank you to Lori for taking the moment to sit down and talk with us today. Um, again, follow all those links if you want to see what she's doing. Really cool stuff. Great resources if you're interested in getting to know your reptiles on a little deeper level than just feeding them and cleaning them, which is very rewarding, as she said. I 100% agree. So make sure you go take a look at all those places that you can follow what she's doing. And then we'll see you back here next week on the Red Line Report again. Thanks for watching. Y'all take care. Tell me if you need me to move it or. Um, no, I think you're. I think you're good. We're it looks. Good right uh, we're we're both sitting right on the rule of thirds line almost. Um, and do you want me to look at the camera or look at you? No, we're, yeah, it's just you and me talking. Yeah. Oh. Camera. If you if you have something specifically no, that you want to no, if you want to. This is your personal camera. So if like you if you if you have something you want to say like, listen guys, I I need you to know this <laughs> this is that's where you look. If you want to address like the audience for whatever reason, just be like, I really want you to know that. You know, whatever it is. Well, this is your thing, so I want to make sure I'm doing what you need me to do to make it a good...